we're going to be talking about exponential functions today. Exponential functions generally and financial applications of exponential functions in particular. In fact, we're going to be discussing compound interest and using the primary financial formula from which all other financial formulas were derived in most cases. Actually, I think all of them, but just in case one or two are not, I want to cover myself. So let's get to work with a general and then more specific explanation. These are the two basic graphs of exponential functions. They start out really close to, well, this one, when this is a whole number, I better make it larger. Y equals three to the X is a typical expo exponential function. Now, why don't we like start at the beginning? A function with an exponent. There are plenty of those, right? F of X equals three X squared. There's an exponent right there. This function has an exponent. But an exponential function has the X up where the exponent goes. So three to the X is a very typical exponential function. E to the X, you're going to meet E. You're going to meet E very, very soon now. E is a number that's about 2.7. So it's actually very close to three. Three to the X, E to the X, their graphs are very close to each other because E is almost three. F of X equals P parentheses one plus R over N parentheses closed to the N T power. Woo, that is the compound interest formula and it's an exponential function. So is this, f of x equals a naught e to the kt power. <clears throat> this is very special, and you'll meet this at the very last class, or very last two classes of this semester. So let's take a closer look at y equals three to, the, three to the x power because it's just so easy. This is the x axis. This is the y axis. And the graph of y equals three to the x goes from negative infinity out on the left to positive infinity out on the right. It's, the graph starts infinitely close to the x-axis, but not touching the x-axis. And it slowly, slowly, slowly grows away from the x-axis. And then about the time it crosses y equals one, it starts to just explode upwards. <sighs> like a fire cracker, like a rocket. In fact, exponential functions <clears throat> grow so quickly, we have to use another kind of fu function to measure them. And you'll meet that one next, but not today. Unless you watch the video today, it's up to you. Now, sometimes exponential functions are decreasing. They start out way up there. 
at positive infinity. In the depths of the universe. And then they drop on down, 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 and get closer and closer and closer to the X axis, but they never touch. Now these, of course, are exponential functions in their home position. They haven't been, they haven't been moved in any way. They haven't been shifted, they haven't been stretched. Give it time. In its home position, the x-axis is a horizontal asymptote for the exponential function, whether it's increasing constantly or decreasing constantly. Notice, in fact, that this only increases and this only decreases. There's no up and down. It's not a polynomial. Let's talk about the compound interest formula. A of t equals p times, well, parentheses, 1 plus r over n parentheses close to the nt. A lot of letters you've got to memorize. A of t is your balance, the amount of, of money that you have, the balance that you have in the bank after time t. t is always in years for this particular formula. p is the amount of money you initially put in the bank. It's called the principal. Just like in the regular interest formula, this is the principal. Now in these parentheses, R is the interest rate, written as a decimal, and N. N is the number of compounding periods per year. Now what is a compounding period? You put your principal, maybe $100, in the bank. Depending on how many compounding periods you have, your interest will be calculated and put back into your balance so that the balance grows. Then the next time your interest is calculated, you'll have a little bit more interest. That will be put into your balance so the balance grows. Now there's a list of what n could equal depending on the number of compounding periods you have. Well, where do we start? How about here? If, if your interest is compounded only once a year, then we say it's compounded annually. If your interest is compounded twice a year, it's compounded semi-annually. This is the most common. If your interest is compounded four times a year, it's compounded quarterly. If your interest is compounded 12 times a year, I bet you've already figured out that's monthly. And if your interest is compounded 365 days a year, no, not 0.25. It's compounded daily. I've actually been told by someone who worked in a bank that this number is different um, in real life, but in math, we use 365 because we're not bankers. There is another one you're going to see, and that is continuous compounding.
And what that means is every, not even every second, but every instant, It's very exciting. Every instant of every minute, of every hour, of every day, of every week, of every month, of every year that your money is in the bank, it's going to be compounded. Constantly. I think we'll leave it that way. There's a different formula. The formula is what we saw up there. A of T equals A naught. Actually, no. Now, some people use A naught, but P naught. Okay, the, um, the initial principle, that is the real, real, real beginning of the money you put in the bank. That little zero down at the bottom always means initial, beginning, in the beginning. And we're not going to make parentheses. Instead, we're going to multiply P naught by E, that number that's about 2.7, and it's raised to the R times T power. Like I said before, you'll meet these at the end of the semester, which is very soon now. You're going to be working with your calculator a lot. No choice here. Let me see if I can make that bigger. 125. 150. Where did you go? 150. There, perfect, all right. Here is a typical compound interest formula, a uh, uh, problem. Suppose that $82,000 is invested at six and a half percent interest, compounded quarterly. All right, if this is what you put in the bank to begin with, then it's the principal, it'll be P. Six and a half percent, well, six and a half percent is 6.5 percent, but we change that to a decimal. 0.065. You do that by taking 6.5 and dividing it by 100. Compounded quarterly means N will equal 4. A. Find the function for the amount to which the investment grows after T years. What they're asking for is a formula. Find the formula. And this isn't really the way I was taught to do it when I was a student, but I was a student back in cave days. Woolly mammoths were walking around and saber-toothed tigers. Well, maybe not, but it's a good story. Um, you'll see that they've gone to another step than I would go to. It's not the raw form, but let's go down here. Here's the answer to part A, find the formula. Here's the raw formula right here. Well, here is the formula for compound interest. I put the numbers in for every variable. P parentheses one plus R over N to the NT power. Not forgetting the final parentheses there. 
Now, what they have done is they have, they being the people who wrote the question, they have calculated this really to make life easier on you. 1 plus 0 0.065 divided by 4 is 1.01625. Now what this lets us do is come up here and get a formula that looks like this. 82,000 parentheses 1.01625 parentheses close to the 4T. You could also write it 8 two zero 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 times one point zero one six two five raised to the four T power T. That's our formula that we're going to use to answer these four questions in part B. Eighty two thousand parentheses one point zero one six two five parentheses closed raised to the four times zero power. Well, that gives you eighty two thousand. And eighty two thousand parentheses one point zero one six two five parentheses close four times three. Notice that these last numbers that I had to write by hand because they were in the calculator, but I ran out of room. Um, the only number that changes is T because we're calculating the amount of money in the account at Time equals zero, that means in the beginning, so of course you would have the beginning amount. Time equals three years, time equals six years, time equals 10 years. And there you have that. Let me get my calculator and show you how to do that. Whatever. Hello. OK, here we go. Now, 82,000 parentheses 1.01625 is that right? Yes. Parentheses closed. Carrot. So you get a little box up there. Four times zero. Enter. You get really good at this after you've done it a few times. Now this is with the newer operating system. And some of you don't have the newer operating system. So I am going to go to mode. MathPrint is, is in the newer operating system. Classic is the traditional older cal, uh, operating system. I'm going to go over and choose that. This way you can see all my keystrokes and uh, the, the, the print wraps. All right, 80, I'm gonna do three years this time. 82,000 parentheses, 1.01625 parentheses closed, carrot, 
carrot like a diamond, parentheses, four times three, if you don't already know it's 12. Well, of course, if you do know it's 12, you don't have to make the parentheses. Let's go backwards and delete. If you, if you know higher math and you know that four times three is 12, then just type caret 12. Enter. And you get 99499.42147. We'll round it, but right now, that's how you would do it. Suppose you don't know. You don't know what four times three is. We'll take care of you. 82,000. Parentheses. 1.01625. Parentheses closed caret. Now, if we're going to multiply four times three, I need to use parentheses. There's the left parentheses, but there's not room, so it wrapped. Four times three parentheses closed. See, whether you use MathPrint and the newer operating system or Classic and the older operating system, you'll still get the same answers. Isn't that a relief? Okay. Now we have to round. What all these instructions here, which are usually in blue, on my math lab they're in blue, it says round to the nearest dollar as needed. Okay, all of them say this, round to the nearest dollar. Well, this is already rounded to the nearest dollar, the first one, 82,000. But here, 99499.42147, 42147. To round to the nearest dollar, the whole number of dollars here is 99499. Every number to the left of the decimal point is the whole part of the number. The fraction part or des well the fraction part is the decimal part. So, what we do is oops, we don't do that. What we do is we look over here at the first decimal place to the right of the whole number part. It's a four. Because it's less than five, it will not cause the nine to round up to a 10. So we just poop, drop it off. Same here. Here's the whole number part. Let's do it with this. The whole number part is right here. And the decimal part is here. The first decimal place next to the whole number part is a three. If it were a five, then that, that three would round up to a four, but it's not a five. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, or, or nine. Um, yeah, it's a one, two, three, or four. If it's one, two, three, or four, that will not cause the number immediately to the left to round up. Aren't we happy? We don't have to round up. We just drop it off. Now, over here, here's the whole number part, and here, here is the first decimal place to the right of the whole number part. Eight is a number bigger than five, so it's going to cause this five to round up to a six. And then we drop these decimals off. 
So our answer will be 156,256. We're going to do exactly the same thing with the next problem, which is basically the same problem, only the numbers are a little different. Oops. Okay, I have messed up again. There we go. Well, well, fine, see if I care. Okay. This time our principal is 73,000. We invest at three and a half percent interest. That's 3.5%. Divide 3.5 by 100, you get 0 0.035. We're still compounding quarterly, so N is four. A, find a function or a formula for the amount to which the investment grows after T years. Here's the formula, the general formula. Here's our specific formula with the numbers put in for the, for the letters. They're not really variables, they stand for numbers. T is the only real variable. It's acting like X. So what we do is we take one plus 0 0.035 divided by four and find out that it's 1.00875 and that's what's going to go in the parentheses. So the formula you would put in the answer box is this, which is written more neatly up here. Then we're going to do the same thing we did before. Find the amount of money after zero years, this time two years, eight years, and 10 years. So I do the same thing. You can see I used math print, but I could just as easily have used classic. 73,000 uh, time parentheses 1.00875 parentheses closed. Carrot four times whatever number of years. I'm being told to calculate two. So here I would have to four times zero years, four times two years, four times eight years, four times 10 years. I get my answers and then I have to round, either up or down, just like before. And you put your answers in the answer boxes. These are actually answer boxes on my math lab, and you already are experts with my math lab by now. I can almost promise you that Melissa will be on the final exam. So learn how to do this. Don't memorize the numbers. The numbers change. But it's Melissa and her birthday. And she gets a $2,000 CD in this version of the problem. It's her sixth birthday and, oh, I probably a grandma or grandpa or both. Give her a CD worth $2,000 which the very next day she puts in the bank, 
um, at 3% interest compounded quarterly. What we're being asked is, if the CD matures on her 11th birthday, how much money will be available to her? And there's the answer. Let's see how they got it. Well, P, the initial amount, is $2,000. R is 0 0.03. N is four, how boring. T is going to be, and you have to be careful here, T is not 11. She doesn't even get the CD until she's six. So T is going to be 11 minus six, which is five. Then you use your compound interest formula. 2000 parentheses one plus blah, 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 blah. Uh, compounded quarterly for five years. That'll be 20. So I, I think a convenient formula you could use would be 2000 parentheses 1.0075 because that's what this equals. And four times five is 20. So you use this and there it is. And you come up with this. And now look, you're being told to round to the nearest cent. You know about cents. Since cents are is two decimal places. So we come down here, if you remember. Here's the first decimal place. Here's the second decimal place. Here's the third decimal place. You have to look at the third decimal place to decide if the second decimal place will be rounded up or just stay the same. Eight will round up six to a seven. So six becomes a seven, and then we drop off the excess decimal places. And that's your answer. It's not worth a whole lot more. But I bet to an 11 year old it would seem like a lot. Unless she follows finances and reads the Wall Street Journal. You never know, she might. Okay. Again, on Melissa's sixth birthday, she gets a $2,000 CD that earns 3% interest compounded quarterly. N equals four. If the CD matures, that means you can take it out of the bank. You have to agree to leave it in the bank for so long. If the CD matures on her 11th birthday, how much money will be available to her? Now, if I were her mother, I would leave it in there or put it in another account so that it doesn't mature until she's 18 if she wants to go to college. You should never force someone to go to college or do anything. It just makes them not want to. But who knows, maybe they'll let her use it on her 11th birthday for something really nice. A drone. Let's move on. Now I like looking at tables. You get used to them when you're in math. The principal is $3,000. The rate of interest is 3%. The time in the bank is three years. And finally, we have a different, a different compounding period. N equals two for semi-annual. 
Woo! Finally. So we'll have 3000 parentheses 1 plus 0 0.03 over 2 parentheses closed raised to the 2 times 3 power. And here I kept everything raw. Um, and it didn't hurt. I still got the right answer. Now this says round to the nearest cent. Let's do that. Here's the first decimal place, the second decimal place, the third decimal place. Nine will definitely cause the two to round up to a three. And then I drop off the additional decimal places so that this is my answer. They go on and on, but they're all the same. Here your principal is 58,495. The interest rate is 5.5%. Compounded quarterly. <sighs> well, but that is the most common compounding period in real life. And the time is six and a half years. OK, the interest rate is 5.5. One half is 0.5. So five and a half is 5.5%. I divide 5.5 by 100, I get 0 0.055. The time is six and a half years, which is 6.5 years. I take all this knowledge and I put it into the formula. 58,495 parentheses, one plus 0 0.055 over four parentheses closed, raised to the four times 6.5 power in T. Well, I multiplied four times 6.5 and I got 26. And I calculated 1 plus 0 0.055 over 4, and I got 1.01375. So that altogether I have 58,495 times 1.01375 raised to the 26th power, which gives me $83,429.88. because the seven rounds the two, uh, rounds the one up to a two. And then I drop those off. You'll notice that here, it tells you the decimal is rounded to two decimal places rather than cents. You never know what they're going to ask you. And finally, I no, not finally. They go on forever. They're exactly the same. And I know that you will get a lot out of looking at these notes, which do all the homework problems for you. Am I wonderful? This problem is different and more interesting, but it is financial. The demand for lumber is increasing exponentially. That means increasing very fast and a lot. The amount of timber, the amount of timber in, in billions of cubic feet, consumed T years after 1997. So 1997 is the beginning year of the study. That's T equals zero. 
can be approximated by this formula, which is a function. where t equals zero corresponds to 1997. And we're being asked, well, how much lumber was consumed in 1998? How much lumber was consumed in the year 2000? How much lumber was consumed in 2010? And you have to figure out what the year is. 1998 minus 1997 is one. You always have to subtract 1997, year zero, from the year that's being asked about. So 2000 minus 1997, 2010 minus 1997. And again, you're going to put that in your calculator. And, and here I used uh, the classic system, so you could see the keystrokes. 63 times, see 63, Parentheses 1.018 parentheses closed. Carrot 1 for one year. Then carrot 3 for three years. Then carrot 13 for 13 years. This is 2010, this is 2000, this is 1998. You are always going to have to round, always, so get used to it. Build your rounding skills back up. And that's it. I love exponential functions. And after this, we're going to be studying exponential functions and their inverse logarithmic functions for the rest of the semester. So talk to you then. Bye bye.